Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 11b. This is the second tutorial in a series related to accounting for capital or financing leases. This tutorial is focused on accounting from the leasee perspective. This deals with scenario B, where we have a situation with a guaranteed residual and where the leaseor's implicit rate is known to the leasee. This is a slightly different scenario than the previous one in tutorial 11a. If you have uh, reviewed it, you'll see the differences. If you have not looked at that one yet, then uh, you should review tutorial 11a after this. They can be viewed independently, however. This tutorial has five major learning objectives. The first is to review how to calculate the lease payments from the leasor perspective. The second would be to calculate the present value of the lease from the leasee perspective and to determine how much is to be capitalized by the leasee. Third, to assess all relevant financing or capital lease classification criteria for the leasee both under IFRS and ASPE. Fourth, to prepare any necessary journal entries from the leasee perspective in situations with a guaranteed residual value and where the leasor rate is known to the leasee and no transfer of ownership. Finally, we will look at how to prepare a partial balance sheet, illustrating how this finance or capital lease should be disclosed by the leasee. This tutorial is based on the Pebbles Company and Bam Bam Inc. A set of data. We will review scenario B in this situation with a guaranteed residual and where the lease or rate is owned. And our first requirement will be to calculate the lease payment as determined by the leaseor. So let's proceed with doing that. Determining the lease payment, uh, again, is always determined by the leasor, never by the leasee. And usually uh, payments are made at the beginning of the period, so your calculator should be in begin mode. So make sure you review the data specifically to determine if payments are beginning or the end. We start with the lease term, so N is 7. We're going to use IY of 10, that's the leasor's uh, rate. The PV you're going to put in as negative 500,000 because that's the asset fair value. The residual is guaranteed, but it, even if it wasn't, you would still include it, even if it was unguaranteed. So FV is 100,000. And if you compute the payment, you'll get 83,784, and that's the same as in tutorial 11A. The next requirement here is to determine the amount to be capitalized by the leasee and to prepare a lease amortization schedule. The lease C PV calculation, you have a lease term of seven years, so 7N. IY is 10. And the reason why IY is 10 in this case as opposed to tutorial 11A is because now the lease source implicit rate is known or is determinable, i.e. the implicit rate can be calculated or determined mathematically. Even the most basic financial calculators are capable of calculating the implicit rate used in a payment calculation. So with IFRS, you really should never have a situation where the leaseor's implicit rate is not known because you can actually calculate it. This differs from ASPE. So under IFRS, we're always going to use the implicit rate. In the case of ASPE, we would use the lower of the IBR or the leaseor rate if known. We know both 10% is less than the 12% IBR, so that's what we're going to go with is the 10%. Now the payment as determined by the leaseor from the previous slide is 83,784 and the guaranteed residual of 100,000 is entered as FV. And if you compute the PV, guess what? You'll get 500,000. Well, that's no surprise because if we're using the same interest rate as the leaseor used to determine the payment, if we use the same rate using the same payment, we'll end up with the same PV that the leaseor used to calculate the payment. So. And since the $500,000 PV is equal to the $500,000 fair value, the amount that the leasee will capitalize is $500,000. Next, we'll show the amortization table. Again, this isn't uh, usually necessary. You wouldn't have to do this likely on an exam because it takes such a long time, but we're illustrating where all the numbers come from. We begin with a balance of 500000 and based on the payment and the interest rate of 10%, you see that the payments are always the same here. Our interest rate is calculated at 10% on whatever the beginning balance is. Remember that the first payment that's made at the beginning is all principal, so the entire 83784 gets amortized against the principal, and there is no interest. The residual is guaranteed. There are seven payments for the lease. So you can see here we have seven payments of 83,784 plus residual at the end. And 
the number of years in the lease is seven years. And the timing of the number of years in terms of when the payments are made are one year later than when the lease is uh, entered into because the payment is made at the inception of the lease and that's basically just as the lease begins. Our third requirement is we will now review all the relevant leasee criteria to classify the lease to Pebbles in both cases of either ASPE or IFRS. Let's first review the classification under ASPE. Recall that under ASPE there are basically four elements to consider. First, is there an explicit transfer of title? In this case there isn't, so the criteria isn't met. Second, is there a bargain purchase option which would result in the presumption that the leasee would retain the asset at the end of the lease term? In this case, there is not a bargain purchase option and so that criteria is not met either. Third, does the lease term of the asset represent 75% or more of the economic life of the asset? Well, in this case, with a lease term of 7 years divided by the economic life of 9 years, that's 78% of the economic life, which is greater than 75%, so this criteria is met. Finally, does the present value of the minimum lease payments exceed 90% of the asset's fair value? In this case, the present value of the minimum lease payments is exactly equal to the fair value of the asset, so this criteria is also met. Overall, two of the four criteria are met, however, only one is required to trigger a capital lease classification under ASPE. As a result, the classification of this lease is a capital lease. Now let's review the classification under IFRS. With the adoption of IFRS 16, this is now pretty easy. IFRS 16 uses a contract basis to evaluate lease contracts, and this results in virtually all lease contracts to be capitalized as finance leases, with the right of use asset and the lease liability recorded by the lessee, other than if deemed to be short term or low dollar value leases, neither of which is the case for this particular situation. As a result, the classification of this lease under IFRS is a finance lease. So now we can proceed with requirement four, and that will be the journal entries to record the lease for 2019, 2020, and 2021, and the journal entries to record settlement in 2026. January 1st, 2019, we enter into the lease, debit the asset under finance lease or capital lease for 500,000, which is the present value. Under IFRS, this is now called a right of use asset. And credit the lease obligation for 500,000. And of course, we have the payment that we have to record at the inception of the lease, $83,784. Debit the lease obligation, credit cash. In some cases, uh, students like to offset these two numbers, so that's okay. We'll proceed with the next part here. So to record the journal entry at the end of December 2019. Uh, now this falls in the same fiscal year. The first thing we'll do is debit interest expense for $41,622, calculated as the $500,000 uh, PV that was set up minus the first 83.784 payment times 10% and 12 out of 12 because the lease was entered into right at the beginning of the year, so no prorating is necessary. We're going to credit interest payable, and that's because the lease payments are actually at the beginning of the year this time instead of the end. Still at the beginning of the lease, but the lease was entered into on January 1st, so the lease payment will be paid the next day. That's when the cash will be transacted. In the previous tutorial, we would have paid cash for this, but now we have to set this up as interest payable. If we want to confirm the numbers from the amortization table, you'll see here, again, the initial payment goes all against the principal, leaving a balance of 416216 multiplied by 10% gives us 41622 Continuing on, we've recorded the interest expense. Our next journal entry now is to record the depreciation expense. Again, that this is a depreciable asset for our purposes. We're going to take the PV. This time we're deducting the $100,000 residual because there is and still over seven years. And we're using seven years because there is no transfer of ownership or there's no BPO, which also basically implies transfer of ownership. So we use the lease term. That works out to 57,143 debit year depreciation expense and credit year accumulated depreciation. Next, we're looking at journal entries for the full year ended December 31st, 2020. On January 1st, 2020, we have a payment credit cash for the 83,784. Debit the interest payable we just set up of 41622 
and that means we're going to credit the lease obligation for the difference, right, to amortize the principal amount, so 42.162. Next, we're going to the year end. We're going to debit interest expense, credit interest payable for the next period's interest, and we can take the initial PV minus the first payment minus the amortization from the second payment times 10% times 10 over 12 gives us 37,405. And if you wanted to refer to the amortization table, that's where we end up with. So here, 500,000 minus the full amortization on the first payment, the amortization on the second leaves you a balance of 374,054, which is what this would be here, times 10%, 37,405. And then finally, the depreciation expense, which is the same as in 2019, will continue every year over the period of the lease. Next, we're looking again at the full year ended, December 31st, 2021. Same approach. We've got our lease obligation, our interest payable in cash, so we'll debit cash for 83,784. We set up an interest payable that now has to be debited for 37,405, and now we will debit the lease obligation for the difference between the two, and that's the amount of amortization. Then the next entry for December 31st is again debit interest expense credit interest payable. This time 32,767 based on PV, right? The initial payment, the amortization of the second payment, and the amortization of the third payment times 10%, of course. So that's 32,767. And you can see here from the amortization table where the numbers come from. So there's our full first amortization, amortization of the second payment, and amortization of the third. And then the last entry at December 31st, 2021, again, the depreciation expense, accumulated depreciation, debit and credit respectively for 57,143. Okay, we're almost finished. Now we'll jump to January 1st, 2026, which is when the settlement of the lease happens. And what I've included down here as well is a snippet of the amortization schedule. So on January 1st, we're going to debit the interest payable of 9093. Now, the only reason why it's 9093 as opposed to the 9091 in the table is because we want to deal with this $2 difference here due to rounding that's built into the payment. This 9093 was accrued on December 31st, so now we're debiting the interest payable. The balance in the lease obligation is 90907. We're going to debit accumulated depreciation for 400000 because we were depreciating it every year. And we're going to credit the asset under the finance lease, which is what the amount was when we set it up. So, of course, the difference between these two items up here, the 9093 and the 90907, of course, is a $100,000 residual, which is what we have here. And the difference between the accumulated depreciation and the asset is also the amount of the residual because the residual is guaranteed. So that's a settlement. And now the final requirement is just to prepare a partial balance sheet for Pebbles as at December 31st, 2021. At December 31st, 2021, we will show as non-current assets, of course, asset under finance or capital lease, if it's ASPI, $500,000, which was the PV that was capitalized. There will be accumulated depreciation of 171429 and that's three years of depreciation right because we had depreciation for 2019 20 21 which nets out to 328,571. next we have under current liabilities the interest payable that would have been accrued from the previous period in preparation for 2022 the end of december 31st 2021 remember we had an interest accrual to interest expense and interest payable for 32,767, and that's because it's current and that's the amount that becomes due in the next year so december 31st 2021 we set this up of course this was paid on january 1st 2022 the current portion there's the interest payable from the amortization table. The current portion of the lease obligation is the difference between the interest and the payment. And so we've got that on the table. So that's the amount of the principal that will be amortized in 2022 within one year from the balance sheet date. And of course, that leaves a long-term liability or non-current liability for the lease obligation of 276,658. And we are finished this problem. Now we can wrap up with some key points to remember.
First is that the lease payments are always determined by the leasor and include a residual regardless of whether the residual is guaranteed or not. And of course, the payment is determined using the leaseor's implicit rate. Most but not all leases have payments at the beginning of the period, so make sure you set your calculator to begin mode, but please read the data carefully so you know what you're dealing with. Next, the leasee takes the payment from the leaseor and determines the present value of the minimum lease payments, or PVMLP, or just PV. The residual is included as a future value in the PV calculation by the leasee only if it is guaranteed. Under IFRS, the interest rate to be used by the leasee is the leaseor's implicit rate, basically because it is determinable. ASPI, on the other hand, uses the lower of the implicit rate, if known, or the leasee's IBR. Under ASPI only, any capital lease criteria for the leasee are based on any one of the following items here to, to trigger a capital lease. So the first, of course, is a transfer of ownership. And the question would specifically state that there is a transfer of ownership or that title reverts back to the lease or if there is no ownership. There's also a consideration of a bargain purchase option or BPO. If there is a bargain purchase option, then it's presumed that the leasee will take the asset. The economic life test takes the lease term divided by the useful life, and if it's greater than 75%, that triggers it automatically for ASPI. Then the economic test looks at the PV versus the fair value. If it's greater than or equal to 90% of the fair value, then under ASPI it's a capital lease. And under IFRS, all leases are determined to be finance leases unless they are deemed to be short term or of low dollar value. And finally, the amount capitalized by the leasee is always the lower of the PV or the asset's fair value. The capitalized amount cannot exceed the asset's fair value. So this concludes tutorial 11b on leasee accounting for uh, capital leases in situations of a guaranteed residual and where the implicit rate is known by the leaseor. If you have not reviewed tutorial 11a for situations with an unguaranteed residual and an unknown interest rate, then you should do that. We hope you found these tutorials useful.